Okay. So I'm Francesca Vidot. Um, I'm a postdoctoral fellow at um, Dr. Buenta's practice. Um, I'm from Puerto Rico. Um, I actually did my PhD there, and I did my internship in Denver. And now I'm doing my fellowship here with Dr. Puente. So today I'm going to be talking um, about forensic neuropsychology and how we practice it um, in his office. So I'm just going to give an overview of what forensic psychology is, then what neuropsychology is, and what is forensic neuropsychology. So um, do any of you guys know like what forensic psychology is, or do you have any ideas? What comes to mind when you think of forensic psychology? It was online, so I don't think that I got much out of it. But um, isn't it just like the like more law-based psychology? That's what I assumed. Like yeah. Like crimes and everything? Yeah. Forensic. Yeah, it's, it's basically um, when you practice psychology, like you, your client has a legal issue. <laughs> um, so it's basically the application of psychology in a legal arena. Like, is, um, death penalty cases, right? Yeah, and I'm going to talk a bit about that um, later on. So usually, you, like, um, since it's legal, there's going to be civil and there's going to be criminal cases. In civil cases, there's custody evaluations, um, there's personal injuries, there's workers' comp. In criminal, there's um, insanity, competency to stand in trial, um, diminished capacity, and that sort of thing. Um, so a forensic psychology has a lot of rules. Um, it involves like research, it involves assessment, sometimes it's just consultation, sometimes um, they design or um, and implement treatments, and other times they have to be like an expert witness in the courtroom. So and then there is clinical neuropsychology, Neuropsychology. Um, what do you guys know about neuropsychology? Just kind of what we've learned in this class. What have you learned in this class? Just a little bit, you know, sparing the brain cutting, and they, that was kind of the start of it. So it's basically the brain behavior relationship. That's what you basically study with um, neuropsychology. Um, it's how the human behavior relates to the normal and abnormal functioning of um, the central nervous system. Um, so Puente is actually, a, he's a neuropsychologist and um, now he does a lot of like forensic neuropsychology. So forensic neuropsychology is basically a combination of both. It's basically applying the neuropsychology knowledge into like a legal system. So um, basically it's the forensic um, neuropsychologist will help assisting um, in understanding the cause um, if they're suspected of like a nervous, a central nervous system dysfunction and behavior, emotion, cognition, which includes also like decision making, judgment, and that sort of thing. So I'm going to talk a bit about like how we do it in our office, and um, and it's usually that's kind of like the standard everywhere, but. So usually you get a referral. It can be from the court. It can be from the attorneys. Um, you first have to ask, as, ask, ask the question if it's within the area of expertise of um, the clinician, the timeline. We usually have a call before we actually see the patient and with the attorneys or whoever um, is the referral source to just discuss what they want. Like, what is their question? Then usually we review records. We review um, school records, we review employment records, medical records, and that sort of thing. We also ask if this person have, has been evaluated before, because there's also like press, practice effects with some of the, some of the tests. And um, then based on that question, he tailors like the interviews <coughs> and the testing and what type of test he's going to give and that sort of thing. Usually the, um, the psychological testing includes tests of effort, especially in forensic cases, tests that, um, of attention, executive functioning, um, memory, intellectual, dis um, intellectual capacity, and um, 
sometimes we there's also like emotional testing and that sort of thing. So I'm just gonna talk about like um, some case that some type of cases we sometimes receive and what we are looking for in those cases. For example, sometimes you can receive um, a case of like a personal injury. Um, so someone claims that um, they had an injury at this place or and um, that person because that person was negligent or that company was negligent and he has to assess he have, they're basically trying to assess if the there was an injury a psychological injury and based on that injury this person is presenting um, these deficits in whatever area so, for so, example, like, what? So you would assess the person who got hurt to see if they were entitled to psychological compensation, basically. Yeah. Um, so, in those cases, you have to review a lot of, like, previous records and that sort of thing, because you want to know if, like, how that person was functioning before, and if this was actually the reason why this person is presenting these deficits or um, these impairments. So... For example, um, something, I was in a store and something fell on me, and after that, I've been having a lot of issues, like, after that I lost consciousness, and then I've been having a lot of issues with, like, my processing speed and my judgment and uh, making decisions, and so I'm seeking for compensation, so, because they were negligent, and, well, I go, um, Usually, the attorney will go to a neuropsychologist and ask for him to do an evaluation to see if this person actually, like, these deficits are um, a cause of that um, situation. So, in a case like that, if it's um, the uh, attorney who's referring, we usually will ask for all, like, the medical records, all the academic or employment records, to see how this person was, this person was functioning before and how this person maybe is functioning now. Um, you also usually do a lot of interviews with like family members or other people who have known this person um, before and then after um, you do that, well, um, there's neuropsychological testing and um, you give them several tests. Usually we do, we give two tests of each area, this is each area. So if we are assessing attention, a lot of times we do the CBT and the RF27. The CPT is a test in a computer in which um, the person is sits in front of the computer and um, basically is presented um, different stimulus and they have to hit either the space bar or hit a, um, a, a letter in the keyboard or that sort of thing. Um, there are two and seven, they have to look for some numbers in um, a they're presented several numbers and they have to just look for um, the, num the numbers two and seven. So, and also like when there's memory testing, we'll, we usually give a whole battery, which the standard battery usually for memory is the Rushler memory um, scale, but there's also smaller um, tests that just assess verbal memory <coughs> and the judge that assess visual memory. Same for um, intellectual functioning, usually he gives several tests assess that a lot of them are just like nonverbal intel uh, measured nonverbal intelligence and then there's um, for example um, the Weschler intelligence scale which is the most widely used um, intelligence scale there's also like the Stanford Binet and there's the beta 4 the C20 which are both like um, nonverbal um, intelligence test so after testing has been done um, First thing we look at usually is effort testing. Was this person putting like effort into their testing? Usually, if the person, um, we usually give a test of effort at the beginning just to see how, because if the person is not cooperating, we try to encourage them to try their best. And um, so um, we look at effort testing. We also look at in emotional um, scales, there's also usually validity scales, so we look at those um, also. So after we've done that, we, we then go into uh, what areas 
um, are impaired, and do these areas have to do with the injury this person had? Have you ever had any like patients fake it? Yeah, and sometimes people sometimes people don't fake it on purpose necessarily. Like some people, they are impaired in some way, but they wanna like it's a cry for help. So I want to appear more impaired than what I actually am. So I'm just like trying to make an effort to like just like in, in certain areas, for example, in memory testing, I'm trying to like seem worse than I actually am because although I'm not doing great, I want to like I want you to really know that I'm not doing great. Same thing happens with emotional things. Like a lot of people in the emotional scales will rate things very high, and then the validity scales in those emotional um, assessments will be very high and. Um, but yeah, there's certainly a lot of people, because especially in, in cases like this and um, personal injury claims, since I'm like at the end I'm going to receive a compensation, um, people do fake it. And it's, it's frustrating a lot of times because you really want this person to try their best and you, yeah. you encourage them and a lot of times since um, I'm supervised by Dr. Point, I have to call him and let him know, like, I don't, this person didn't do too well on, like, effort testing, and he'll come in and talk to them. Yeah. Um, if there's an attorney involved, they also, sometimes we mention, like, oh, hey, he, I don't think he's trying his best, why don't you, like, talk to him and encourage him to, or her to try her or his best. Um, so, yeah, we then look at all the testing and see that has to do and then we discuss this with the attorneys and the attorneys will decide if um, they're going to go along with your evaluation and um, sometimes the other part will come and interview you basically it's um, that's a deposition and they'll ask you questions about the case and about what you did and that sort of thing sometimes they'll ask you very specific questions to try to like get you off guard or, or try to like discredit you so then they can say like oh if this person doesn't remember the time he tested whatever like how are you going to believe the rest of his test and that sort of thing and that usually happens after a set um, before settlement um, and before trial and um, sometimes you have to go then to trial and be an expert witness and they'll ask you questions about um, everything about your findings and that sort of thing other cases, for example, in the criminal side, a lot of the cases he gets um, are death penalty cases, and usually they're not they're not like very straightforward. There's a lot of things going on. He also, since he speaks Spanish, he also gets a lot of like um, death penalty cases as Spanish speaking um, clients. Um, in 2003, there was um, this case, um, the Atkins. Um, case, which was a, um, it became a decision of the Supreme Court that no one who had an um, intellectual disability could be um, sentenced to like a death penalty. So sometimes he gets cases that were sentenced before this ruling, so now they're going to go to trial again and see this person, so he has to assess this person. Um, when you're assessing for an intellectual, like he does give them a lot of neuropsych testing and he also um, obviously we'll test for IQ and usually for a person to um, meet the first one of the first criteria for an intellectual disability the person has to have an IQ of 70 but it can go five points down five, five points up um, and then if that testing is within that range and like we see there's some deficits usually you will also assess like prong two Prong two is adaptive functioning, which is the other area in intellectual disabilities that is very important. Um, with there are several tests that assess those that area. They're standard tests like the ABAS and the Vineland, but a lot of those tests um, haven't been normed like where these people come from if they're from like other cultures like from Mexico or they're from El Salvador or and they live very in a very rural area so sometimes it becomes very difficult to test to give these tests to these people and um, some people Just sometimes the cultural like, differences yeah and the same thing happens with the IQ test there's a lot of like differences also 
Um, but then, uh, then again, you're assessing them in the U.S., so it's like they they, they come from another culture, and like yeah, it's sometimes it, it gets pretty complicated. But um, so, for example, when he, um, he will give them this test, these tests, if he's able to, the person, because there's sometimes people who like you first, the people you're you're able to interview might not be able to read or write. So then that becomes an issue. So a lot of times these evaluations um, require a lot of interviewing because I inter like, you have to interview a person and be sure that that information they're giving you is accurate. So you're going to interview several people to come up with a conclusion of what actually is going on. Or if it's like if this person had these adaptive um, functioning deficits, this person in the practical area wasn't functioning as well, or this person in the conceptual area wasn't functioning that well, um, as well. Um, so, in many cases, he first sees the patient. He he doesn't always have to do all the prongs, but in the case when he does have to do the prongs, all the prongs, he will interview the person. He will do the testing. He would do the IQ testing and that sort of thing, and then he would go into like if he's also assessing prong two, he would try to find people who can do these tests um, out of all the, um, the list of people who are available. And then he would also interview these people. And you would also look at a lot of records, because if they're saying he <coughs> had a lot of difficulties in school and he didn't do good in school, and but then you look at the records, the school records, and he was one of the highest grades, it's like, you have to look for consistency. And a lot of times <coughs> in many in many in many schools like years ago, the grades everyone wanted you to like be able to go like to the next grade. You weren't held up at, like so sometimes even though they didn't flunk them, they still were in the lowest average. So sometimes we get these clients' grades, but we also get like all the other classmates' grades, and we will average all the grades out and see what was the average, how was he compared to the average, what was his rank in the class, and all those things. Also, um, medical records will tell you a lot, and um, employment records will also tell you a lot, because yes, this person was working, he was able to, but what was he actually doing? And a lot of times you also like interview uh, employers and employees that actually work with this person to find out. Um, so these evaluations a lot like take a lot of time. Um, and also you have to be very good at interviewing, you have to be very good at report writing, and a lot of times to be an expert witness, to be able to be assertive and to be able to like communicate um, your answers correctly. And there's a lot of case review that goes on constantly. Because you also have to be very up to date with literature. And with even with these cases, like this, um, the Atkins case I was talking about, like then there was a ruling about another case, which I don't recall the name of the client, that was basically no one below the age of 18 can be sentenced to death. Then there was the hall, which um, was the hall in Florida, which um, the person got a 71 in the IQ test, and originally the cutoff was 70. So now there's, since there's like a standard error, well, it can go up to 75, and there's also a lot of other things that have to be taken into consideration. Um, IQ is not just a number. And as I was mentioning before, a lot of these tests sometimes um, for, for example, in the U.S., the, the mean is 100. Or, and I was recently talking to Dr. Puente, and there is, I think it's the Mexican way, so it's 90, it's the mean. Like, so the average, like in the middle, if you look at a bell curve, do you guys know what a bell yeah. curve is? So there's like one standard deviation or two standard deviations. Usually these people with these impairments, when you consider someone um, who's impaired, that person is usually in 
like two standard deviation be low with a mean. So, um, is the di- sorry, <laughs> is the difference between it like they aren't actually less intelligent than we are, they just are intelligent in a different way because they can't take our tests or they don't know how to test like we, you know? There's a lot of issues that come into play. Um, I think they've been trying to make these tests better, but a lot of times it has to do with the population the test was normed with. Um, Here in the U.S., they make a great effort for the ways to be very representative of the general population. So they test a lot of people from different areas, very rural areas and very like big cities and that sort of thing. So we actually have a test that is representative of the population. In a lot of places, these tests aren't given are aren't given um, to represent like the po- general population. A lot of times they're given because in areas which maybe are a bit more rural and are people are more accessible and easier to test. Um, are they given a, our tests though? Or are they like specified for that country? Are they changed a little bit for the cultural should, differences? Yeah, yes. Because, for example, um, test here will ask questions about different, maybe important people from, like, that only people who live in the U.S. can know. And um, so there's questions that are very specific for the different cultures. And there's also some processing things that usually um, they give more time. And because people in the U.S. tend to be quicker than people in Latin America, um, which... If you think of, like, life, usually here life is, like... Well, we're trained yeah. to be like that. So, yeah, there's there's questions that are going to be adapted and changed to, like, for, for it to be, like, culturally sensible. Um, but they're similar. If you think of, like, the waste in Mexico, the waste in, like, they're pretty similar. The, the waste from Spain and the U.S. ways, they're similar in, like, the different subtests that are given, Um, and some of the questions are very similar, but they're arranged in different orders, Um, and sometimes the rules here are more strict as to, like, I can give you 1.2 points for 0, 4, and if you repeat the same, like, a a synonym can actually be a 0 in the ways here, and it can actually be a one in the Mexican ways, and um, so yeah, it some like a lot of times it becomes an issue. Um, so yeah, he's he sometimes has to like testify um, as an expert witness. Sometimes the case is settled before that, so sometimes you don't have to um, go to trial or anything. I had a question. I forgot it. Um, so for cases that are, let's say, like, ruled on already, and then they come out with, like, a new law, like, the death penalty for 18 years or younger, would they have to, like, go and reopen that case, or it's, like, already closed and ruled on, so it's, like, it is what it is? Sometimes they do. I think it's the, like, I don't know, the terms, like, habeas corpus or something. It's, like, I was sentenced to this, which now is... Like has changed, yeah. That's why a lot of people, after the Atkins ruling, have been able to uh, get out of um, a death penalty because if you go back to the case and you see this person was a, um, this person has an intellectual disability, and but yeah, you can go back. Um, and yeah, I think that was all I was going to discuss. Do you guys have any additional questions? Thank you.